Hi, my name is Megan, and I'm so grateful and thankful that you decided to join us for day three, a week of prayer. Our theme for this year is Research the Heart, and it, it is our prayer that this week of prayer will serve as a revival for your spiritual life, that you will be able to restart and be better than you were before. So today, my prayer for you is that you restart and truly allow God to move. Have a great day. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for giving us life and health and strength. Thank you that we all have the chance to be together. Even if it's virtually, Lord, this is a great blessing and a great opportunity for us to grow together in your love and in your care. So we thank you. I pray especially for those who are in distress right now in this troubling time, those who have been affected by this disease, those who have loved ones who have died from this disease, Lord. You are bigger than anything, Lord, including this. And so we put our hope in you and we trust in you. Um, I pray that you will be with all of those watching and listening um, online. Please be with them, be with their families. I pray on behalf of all the teachers and the faculty and the students of Andrews Academy that you will help us and strengthen us so that we can be blessings to members of our community even now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, in Proverbs we are told, above all else, guard our heart, for it is the wellspring of all life. Everything flows out of our hearts, Lord, and the health of our heart is central. So during this week of prayer and spiritual emphasis as we are focusing on restarting our heart. Lord, we pray that we would guard our hearts because it is so easy during this time to be anxious, to be overwhelmed with worry, to be distracted. And yet, Lord, if life is to flow from our heart, we must nurture that heart. So we ask that you would be with us, that you would heal wounded hearts, that you would give strength to those that are lacking courage, or that you would remind us that you are with us always, no matter our circumstances, no matter whether we feel your presence or not, you are here and you are God. Lord, we praise you for this Andrews Academy family. We praise you for this community, for these students, for those who are leading out and who are using their hearts to serve you. Lord, be with each one of the families. Be with each student at Andrews Academy. I pray that this week you would put a fence up around us, that you would protect us, that you would shelter us, that you would open our minds and open our hearts. We thank you for your love and the way that you have already blessed us. We look forward to the ways that you will continue to bless us. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for giving us hearts that feel. May we guard them. May we nurture them. May we use them for your kingdom and your service. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19 says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, that which shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert.
hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. No matter where you are or what time of day it is, thank you for joining us for another day of week of prayer. My name is Chris Goga. I'm the NHS pastor at Andrews Academy, and I'll be doing the sermon for today. So I'm sure many of you have seen or at least heard of the show on my blog. For those who haven't heard of it, I'll try not to spoil too much. So there's this one character. His name is Jamal, and he's, I guess for lack of a better term, an interesting person. In the very first episode, we find out that he's invested in finding a treasure that he's only heard stories about. Based off some context clues, we can piece together that his family and his friends already think he's strange. At least a little strange, but Jamal keeps looking for this treasure. And he keeps looking and looking and working and working. And there was even a point where his friends joined in to try to help, but they didn't believe in it as much as he did, and they got discouraged pretty easily. But Jamal, until the end, clung to this legend, even when it was a risk to his personal safety and his pride. He found himself alone, with nobody who believed him, but in desperation he and by desperation, he kept going and going and going. And at the very last moment of the first season, we discovered that he found what he was looking for. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here where we are right now. Thank you for this amazing week of prayer that you've given us the opportunity to have even in this time of Corona. God, thank you for all the gifts you give us, and please hide me behind your cross, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's this character in the Bible that I know at least most of us have heard about. Whenever we tell her story, we tend to f focus on what she did instead of looking at who she was and trying to see the story from her perspective. It makes sense. Her part of the story is relatively small in comparison to massive contributors like Joshua, Caleb, and, and a massive army of Israelites that marched around Jericho. And if we're being honest, her story is pretty uncomfortable to talk about. But regardless, to the best of my ability, I'm going to attempt to tell the story from her perspective. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm going to be talking about Rahab. Rahab was someone with an uncomfortable backstory. The Bible describes her, describes her as a harlot or a prostitute. In fact, almost every time you hear the name Rahab, it's, it, it's always Rahab the prostitute or Rahab the harlot, depending on what version you're reading. But what the Bible doesn't say is why. One likely story that um, may have ended in this was she may have been abused as a child and was forced into that situation. Another may be that she had no other option had to do to support her family, but no matter the reason, we have evidence that she was treated very poorly by her community, even though she was pagan. You see, we read in Joshua chapter 2 verse 15, then since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let down a rope through the window. If we further analyze the prevailing culture of the time, we see that Rahab was likely push, pushed to the very edge of her community as a sign of rejection. The reason that she was on the city wall was it was as if her, her city was telling her in the clearest way possible that she didn't belong, that she could only be at the very, very edge of at the edge of society. So far, she couldn't even be within it. She had to be on the wall. They got her the farthest that they could without completely pushing her out. This doesn't just mean they rejected her, but it also means that if someone wanted to find her because of her business, they would know where to look. Now, this next part we aren't directly told in the Bible, but there's a strong possibility in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. 
And they went and came into a harlot's house, named Rahab, and lodged there. So the spies were doing their thing, but the word got around that there were some spies in the area. Or at least there was panic that there was the thought of spies being in the area. And this, and this definitely triggered a lot of chaos, a lot of panic. It led to the closing of the gates, road checks, and much more. In fact, in verse 2, the king of Jericho was told that not only were there spies, but the messengers figured that they were Israelite spies. The last part is interesting, and I'll, get, and I'll get back to it, but first I want to go back to the spies. When they realized that the surrounding people thought that they were spies, they, they, they couldn't ex escape the city. The walls, the gates were closed, there were likely road checks, everyone was wary about the people walking around. They needed somewhere to hide, but the question is, where would they hide? You'll notice in the verse I previously I previously read, it mentions that they came into the harlot's house before it even mentions Rahab's name. You see, they must have known that the harlot's house would be at the very edge of society, in the city wall. So they went there, a place where they wouldn't think anyone would look for them because it was so far from society. It was so shunned from society. It was somewhere that in a time of panic, no one would really want to go. But this, is, but this is where it gets a little tricky. When reading these verses, you may come to the realization, how did Rahab know they were Israelite spies? They must have looked simu similar because they were from similar people groups. And they likely dressed similar. But maybe this is how. Rahab was a prostitute, and as such, she was used to man after man after man finding her house on the very edge of the community just so they could, for lack of a better term, make use of her services. But these men must have been different. They were looking for something different, and the way they looked for that thing was different. She must have connected the dots. The fact that these guys treated her better than any other guy she had been with or had passed by her house, and the fact that just about everyone knew that there were two Israelite spies within the gates. It must have clicked, but here's the thing. When Rahab found out that these men were Israelites, she didn't run, she didn't scream, she didn't alert the authorities, but she protected them. Even though she was from this pagan city, she not only hid them and helped them, but in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that a, far that, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so, so that all that live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. So even in this place, this pagan place, Rahab had not only heard of God, but she proclaimed God as the one true God. In her own words, the Lord your God is God in heaven above, and earth below. Whether she was an abused child or a desperate mother, she definitely was, when, when she was participating in the most degrading activity that she could really do. She must not have fully realized it, but the amazing stories that she heard from her friends about the God of the Israelites, they were all true. The God that she probably cried to when she was by herself, because nothing was working out. He showed himself to be real in her life. Not only that, but this same God was preparing Rahab to do a great work for him, saving those spies. And in turn, he not only saved her, but her family and the people around her too. When the walls of Jericho were crumbling, there was one part that didn't collapse. One house that was untouched by the tragedy that every other person 
in that entire city faced. Not only were they saved, but Rahab went on to marry a man from the tribe of Judah. She was given the honor of becoming the ancestor to King David, and eventually Jesus Christ. So even when she couldn't see God's hand in her life, she was doing things that she wasn't very proud of. God was working in her life and made her an amazing part of his glorious plan. The part of the main text coming from Isaiah 43 verses 18 to 19 that I was given says, See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? So even when you've had a hard life and feel as though you've done unforgivable things, God is still working in your life, even when we don't see it. And even to bring this a little closer to home, even though we are ravaged with this infectious disease that we formally call COVID-19, and even though it's been hijacking our whole lives, God is still in control. He has never stopped being in control, and he will never stop being in control. So as we continue this week of prayer, I'd like to encourage you by saying that just like in Rahab's life, God still has a plan even when we don't see it. Even when the burdens of life try to bring us down, even when you cannot see your way out, God still has a plan. Thank you. Please bow your heads with me for prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this beautiful day outside, and thank you that we can all come together and worship you. Please be with us throughout our week as we try to figure out online school and be with all the teachers here at Andrews Academy. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.